a teenage girl is found murdered in her Indiana home. And police soon suspect that she is not this killer's only victim. Detectives race the clock to track a serial killer across the country before he strikes again. Someone is targeting elderly women in a gated California community. With no witnesses and little physical evidence, investigators struggle to find a link between the murders. For homicide investigators, it's difficult to predict when and where a serial killer will strike next. But with the help of forensic examiners, they can isolate tiny clues that can lead them to the killer who is driven by bloodlust. In this episode, some of the names have been changed. An hour's drive south of Chicago, Griffith, Indiana is home to 18,000 people. People drawn here by the quiet lifestyle and the low crime rate. Hey, Wendy. Around 7 p.m. on October 13, 1987, 15-year-old Christine Gallagher returned home from school. I can't believe what happened at the swim meet today. She called out to her older sister, Wendy, but there was no response. Hey, Wendy. Though Mrs. Gallagher was still at work, Wendy should have been home from school hours ago. Christine checked the bedroom. Oh, my Wendy. There, she found 16-year-old Wendy's oh, lifeless Wendy. body on the floor. Griffith police and crime scene units were immediately dispatched to the Gallagher apartment. The distraught teenager was taken to a squad car as police made their way into the residence. Inside the apartment, the living room was neat and orderly. But in the bedroom, police discovered the gruesome scene. The semi-nude victim had been gagged, her hands tied behind her back with a bedsheet. She'd been stabbed repeatedly. It appeared that she had been sexually assaulted, but no biological evidence was recovered. For Lieutenant John Mowry of the Griffith Police Department, the scene was difficult to comprehend. When I walked into that apartment and saw the victim, Wendy Gallagher, and saw the savage manner in which she had been killed, I've never seen anything like that. I, I was on the department 17 years prior to that, have investigated other homicides. I've never seen anything that even comes descriptively close to the way that scene was. Investigators began to methodically process the scene. Next to the window, they discovered blood spatter on the wall and curtain. Hoping to find prints, they treated the wall with silver nitrate, a chemical that reacts to the oils found in fingers and palms. Then they scanned the area with a light source. A partial palm print and more blood spatter emerged. The section of wall was removed and forwarded to the crime lab. In the living room, investigators collected a drinking glass with smudged fingerprints. They also found a denim jacket hanging on the back of a chair. Searching the pockets, they found a driver's license. It belonged to a teenage boy with a local address. Run a check on that part. 
On the kitchen counter, detectives recovered a woman's purse. There was no identification inside. Outside, Christine told police that her father had dropped her off after a school swim meet. She said that since their parents' recent divorce, she and Wendy would sometimes be by themselves after school until Mrs. Gallagher returned from work soon after. As Christine continued answering questions, one of the investigators brought out the purse found in the kitchen. Let me, let me show you something. See if you know Christine said it was hers. She added that when she arrived home, she didn't remember seeing Wendy's purse anywhere. Then, Mrs. Gallagher returned from work and learned about the murder. Overwhelmed with grief, she told police she couldn't believe anyone would want to kill her daughter. Wendy was such a beautiful and cheerful girl. When shown the ID from the denim jacket, the Gallaghers recognized the boy immediately. He was Wendy's boyfriend. Looking for any clue to the killer's identity, examiners at the Lake County Crime Lab began to analyze the prints recovered from the Gallagher apartment. They started with the smudged drinking glass. When dusted with black powder, two distinct sets of fingerprints were revealed. Analysis of the arches, whorls, and loops that makes each print unique established that one set was Wendy's. But the second set of prints didn't match any of the Gallagher's. Next, examiners turned to the section of wall removed from Wendy's bedroom. To preserve the fragile drywall, they worked from photographs. Again, the partial palm print didn't match samples taken from any of the Gallagher's. Its position on the drywall in relation to the blood found around the window led evidence technician Ronald Latch to conclude that whoever left it had been startled. He put one hand on the wall and looked out the curtain because you could see blood on the edge of the curtain and on the wall and looking out to see if somebody was coming. Maybe he heard a voice or a car door slam. But the concern must have been short-lived. Crime scene analysis uncovered no signs of a forced entry or exit. It appeared that after committing this brutal murder, the killer calmly left the apartment, probably through the front door. Convinced that the unidentified prints were the key to revealing the killer's identity, investigators ran them through APHIS, a computer database that holds millions of fingerprint records. But no matches were found. Detectives turned to Wendy's boyfriend for answers. They wanted to know why his jacket and ID were found in the Gallagher's apartment. Um, my coat pocket. The teenager explained that Wendy had been cold that day at school. He'd loaned her his jacket and she'd worn it home. He said he was home with his parents during the time of the murder. He also told police he had no idea who could have hurt Wendy. She was very popular at school, where she was an honor student and a pom-pom girl. He said Wendy was a lot of fun to be with, and he couldn't believe she was gone. I was in the back of the class. I'm going to go get this folder open. Though he had a solid alibi, detectives fingerprinted him before letting him go. 
but analysis of his prints later confirmed his innocence. Police spent the next several days interviewing dozens of Windy's friends and neighbors. Over 50 potential suspects were developed, but fingerprint analysis eliminated all of them. According to Detective Carl Grimmer, tensions in the small town grew as the investigation hit a dead end. Within the community of Griffith after this occurred, there was a lot of fear. Um, we didn't know who we were looking for. We didn't know if we were looking for somebody that lived in our town, somebody in a neighboring town, or if it could have been a drifter. But a week after the murder, police got a solid lead. A woman in Chicago had found Wendy's missing purse. I understand you uh, found a purse that we were been looking for. The purse somehow ended up in my purse. I had she explained that her own purse had been snatched during an assault. The purse actually ended up in mine. Yes, when it was later recovered from a dumpster and returned, she opened it and found Wendy Gallagher's purse and ID stuffed inside. Then she'd heard about the murder in Griffith. She's walking home down an alley and this, this car pulls up. The woman said that as she left work through the back door, a man with brown hair and a mustache jumped out of a blue car. He grabbed her and threatened her with a knife. As they struggled, a delivery truck pulled up. Panicked, the assailant grabbed her purse and fled. But he had left behind valuable evidence. A witness who could identify him and a physical link to Wendy's murder. I can recall he had, I guess, brown hair. Police quickly released a composite sketch of the suspect, along with a description of his blue car. Over the next several weeks, they received many leads as a result, but none of them panned out. Despite the lack of progress, investigators refused to give up Everybody who had walked into that crime scene that night and saw Wendy, uh, that's all the incentive you needed to keep going, to find out who had done that to her. Griffith detectives had a composite sketch and fingerprints that could prove murder. But until they could identify their suspect, that evidence was meaningless. And all indications suggested that Wendy Gallagher was not going to be this killer's last victim. Several months had passed with little progress in the murder case of 16-year-old Wendy Gallagher. Though Griffith, Indiana police had a composite drawing of their suspect and prints recovered from the murder scene, his identity and his whereabouts remained unknown. As they struggled to keep the case alive, an improbable lead was called in by police in Pasco uh, County, no, Florida, located more than 1,100 miles away from Griffith, Indiana. That's correct. Yes, method of operation. While investigating the homicide of a 14-year-old girl there, Florida police believed that a resident had uncovered a connection to Wendy Gallagher's unsolved murder. Who was your lead detective on this case? That resident. Diane Collins had just moved to Pasco County from Griffith, Indiana. As details of the Florida murder were made public, Diane immediately noticed similarities to the homicide in Griffith. The frighteningly familiar details compelled her to contact the police. I was very much struck by the fact that this was another young teenage girl who was murdered in her home um, after school hours, just as um, Wendy was in the community I had just left. Griffith police were skeptical that such a tenuous lead could impact their case, but they had little else to go on. They asked Pasco County investigators to forward the case files. According to police reports, in January 1988, 14-year-old Janet Clark was discovered in her bedroom by her younger brother shortly after 6 p.m.
He and Mr. Clark had just returned home from running an errand. Janet had been home from school just a few hours. When police arrived, they found Janet's partially clad body gagged and bound, her hands tied together with a bed sheet. She'd been viciously knifed and raped. No prints had been found at the scene. And while DNA evidence was recovered during autopsy, investigators had no suspect to link it to. But now, Griffith detective Carl Grimmer realized that Diane Collins' instincts might have been dead on. We thought it was a long shot that the two cases could be connected. But when we, we sat and studied the photos, studied the crime scenes, we became stronger and stronger in our belief that they probably were connected. It's just, you had to see it to see the similarities. It's almost like there was a signature. Believing they were now searching for the same killer, the two departments began exchanging information. Pasco County, Florida police intensified their investigation. One of the Clark's neighbors recalled a man in the neighborhood around the time of Janet's murder. She had never seen him before. She described the man to a police sketch artist as being in his late 20s with dark hair and a mustache. She believed that he was driving a late model red Corvette with Missouri license plates. Though the description of the vehicle was different, Griffith police couldn't ignore the striking similarities to their suspect. For Detective Mowry, there was little doubt that a serial killer was on the loose. Time definitely was our enemy. We knew from what we had seen thus far how savage this person was. So we were, we were virtually racing against a clock. We wanted to apprehend him as quickly as we could to prevent him from hurting anybody else. But police knew that tracking a multi-state killer would be difficult. Until he struck again, all they could do was wait. And they feared this killer wouldn't make them wait very long. Two months later, police in Beaumont, Texas responded to reports of gunfire at a local motel. Responding officers burst into the room where the shots had been heard. There, they discovered one of their own, Officer Paul Halsey, unconscious, the victim of a gunshot wound. The fallen officer had notified dispatch just a few minutes before that he was checking on the driver of a stolen vehicle who had just entered one of the rooms. Officer Halsey was rushed to the hospital but his injuries proved fatal. He died a short while later. A witness at the motel stated that he heard gunfire and looked out his window. He saw a man with dark hair and a mustache speed away in a red Corvette. All points bulletin was issued for the red sports car. And within a few minutes, dispatchers reported that the vehicle had been spotted. The sports car was able to elude police for more than 20 miles. But the driver suddenly lost control and the car swerved off the road. He fled into a wooded area on foot and disappeared. Texas authorities began preparing their manhunt for a suspected cop killer. While police in Indiana and Florida struggled to track down a serial killer who preyed upon young girls, Police 2,000 miles away in Beaumont, Texas, 
were on the trail of a suspected cop killer. Though the suspect had managed to escape, police had his abandoned red Corvette. Thank you, How you doing? All right. Inside, they recovered a blood-stained 357 Magnum that had been recently fired. 357. They also found stolen license plates, including a set from Missouri. Now their focus was on finding the driver. Detective Ray Beck of the Beaumont Police Department organized the manhunt. The word was out. So we had officers coming in from everywhere, just volunteering their time, their effort. So manpower was unbelievable. Through witnesses, police learned that the suspect had jumped into a taxi and was headed toward Houston. Officers quickly caught up with the cab. Taxi driver, get out of the car! Taxi passenger, get your hands up! The man believed responsible for the murder of Officer Halsey was taken into custody. Keep your hands up, get out of the car. Keep your hands where I can see them. Turn around, over here on the trunk. The suspect, identified as 28-year-old Michael Lee Lockhart, was questioned at the Beaumont police station. He immediately confessed to shooting Officer Halsey, but offered no explanation. It seemed too easy. Robert Hobbs, an investigator with the Jefferson County District Attorney's Office, recalls Lockhart's interview. He was very calm, he was very collected, we knew right away that we were, um, that this was not our typical criminal in Southeast Texas, uh, and that we would have our work cut out for us. Their instincts told them Lockhart wouldn't have killed a police officer over a stolen car. There had to be more, a lot more, to this murder. Investigators fingerprinted Lockhart and collected hair samples. He was held without bond on capital murder charges. Ballistics results, bolstered by Lockhart's confession, gave Beaumont detectives an airtight case. But Lockhart's quick confession still seemed too calculated, as if he might be trying to head off further investigation. Evidence recovered from Lockhart's motel room indicated he'd been on the move for months. Police had recovered several hotel and restaurant receipts from throughout the Midwest. But what was he running from? Hoping to find out, Detective Ray Beck wrote an article profiling Lockhart and details of Officer Halsey's murder for a national law enforcement magazine. The tactic paid off. A detective working the Janet Clark murder in Pasco County, Florida, read the article on Lockhart and Officer Halsey's murder. He then called the Beaumont Police Department. Detective Beck quickly understood why. One of the missing links to their case was the fact that their red Corvette had Missouri license plates. And that was one of the pieces of evidence that we had here was uh, Missouri license plates that we found in the Corvette. Detective Beck next learned about the connection to Wendy Gallagher's murder. Investigators working that case in Griffith, Indiana were immediately notified. They requested that Lockhart's prints be forwarded to the Lake County Crime Lab. Hoping they had the evidence they needed to prove murder, examiners went to work, comparing Lockhart's fingerprints to those recovered from the Windy Gallagher crime scene. After scrutinizing and comparing both sets of prints, examiner Ronald Latch was certain that Windy's killer had been found. The fingerprints we found at the scene put Michael Lee Lockhart in that apartment 
and the palm prints put them right next to the body of the victim, where there was blood and on the curtain in the wall. Nearly eight months after Wendy Gallagher was found murdered in her home, investigators finally had the evidence they needed to charge Michael Lee Lockhart with her murder. I felt a great sense of relief because I knew that he couldn't commit any more crimes. And I also felt happy that we would be able to contribute and help bring some semblance of closure to the Gallagher family. On June 30th, 1988, DNA analysis confirmed that Lockhart had murdered and sexually assaulted Janet Clark in Florida. Working together, three police agencies had tied three seemingly unrelated murders to one predator. Based on the evidence, police believe that Lockhart traveled the country in search of his next victim. Hey, those are right down the road. Can I use your He would prowl an area, hunting for vulnerable young victims. When he knew they were alone, he would con his way into their homes, where he would rape and murder them. Michael Lee Lockhart stood trial for murder in all three states. He was sentenced to death in each trial. In Texas, on December 9, 1997, Michael Lee Lockhart was executed for his crimes. It took the cooperative effort of three police departments to track a transient serial killer across the United States. But sometimes, murderers who stay in one place are just as hard for investigators to find. 75 miles from Los Angeles, Riverside County, California is a haven for retirees and people looking to escape the problems of urban life. But on February 16, 1994, a 911 call brought police from the Riverside County Sheriff's Office to a condo in the upscale community of Canyon Lake. There, Investigators found the body of 86-year-old Norma Davis slumped in an easy chair. A phone cord was wrapped around her throat and knives protruded from her chest and neck. Investigators began searching the scene, looking for anything that could tell them who had murdered Norma Davis and why. Robbery appeared to be an unlikely motive the victim still wore an expensive ring on her finger. It's expensive as that ring. Is it A few desk drawers were open, but there were no signs of ransacking. Forensic technicians processed the body, looking for any stray hairs or fibers that the killer may have left behind. But from the position of the body, it was clear to California Department of Justice criminalist Elisa Mayo Thompson that there was little interaction between the victim and killer. She appeared to just be sitting in her chair as if she were perhaps reading or watching TV. It didn't appear that she had made much of a struggle or had attempted to get up from that chair. Yeah. That told investigators that Norma Davis most likely knew her killer. The knives were removed and sent to the crime lab to be tested for prints. A search of the condo confirmed that robbery was not a motive. On the kitchen floor, investigators found Norma's purse, still containing credit cards and cash. Watch the footprint over here. In the hallway, investigators spotted a faint shoe print on the floor. To get a better look, the room was darkened. Closer examination revealed that it was a sneaker print left in dust. And recovering such fragile evidence would be tricky. But in a crime scene that yielded few clues to the killer's identity, the print could prove to be a vital piece of evidence. 
After thoroughly photographing the print, technicians carefully applied an adhesive gelatin to lift it. But the minute details of the print didn't survive the lift. It would be up to examiners to determine if there was a sufficient sample to do future comparisons when and if a suspect emerged. Outside, detectives talked to Alice Williams, who had found the victim. She stated that she had come over to pick up Norma for their weekly hair appointment. She let herself in when Norma didn't respond to her calls. That's when she discovered the body. She couldn't understand how such a thing could have happened in Canyon Lake. It was a gated community with round-the-clock security. Norma's ex-daughter-in-law, Mary Pierce, had also arrived at the scene. She too lived in Canyon Lake. She told investigators that she and Norma were very close. But as Mary continued describing Norma in greater detail, detectives glanced down and noticed she was wearing Nike sneakers. They asked if there was anyone close to Norma who would want her dead. Mary reacted with shock, insisting no relative could possibly be involved. But now, detectives weren't so sure. They turned to the crime lab for answers. But criminalists at the California Department of Justice Forensic Lab determined that all of the evidence recovered from the condo had been wiped clean of prints. One of those stains could have come from her. There were no stains. They hoped the recovered shoe print could lead them to Norma's killer. For Ricky Eldon Cooksey, a criminalist with the Department of Justice Crime Lab in Riverside, shoe print evidence can carry investigators a long way. A shoe print collected at the crime scene can help the investigators if we can identify what kind of shoe made that print, and there are data banks that store that type of information, we can tell them what type of shoe they're looking for and size shoe they're looking for. After reviewing hundreds of different sneaker tread designs, Cooksey believed that the print recovered from Norma Davis's home had been made by a Nike. He acquired a similar sneaker from the manufacturer and made test prints. The tread design was identical. Cooksey had determined that the suspect's print had been made by a size six and a half Nike Air tennis shoe. For detectives, the news was not that encouraging. I'll talk to you later. Okay. Tracking down a specific purchase of such a popular shoe would be next to impossible. Thank you. The only thing that homicide detective Joe Greco could infer from the analysis was that the suspect was a small male, or possibly a woman. And he already had a potential suspect who fit Thank that you. description. Goodbye. We suspected the ex-daughter-in-law, Mary Pierce, because of the, the shoes that she was wearing when she came to the crime scene. And the brand of shoe matched the brand of shoe that we found in the doorway. And uh, also, she was the caretaker. She was the obvious choice. Police questioned Mary Pierce so in greater detail, carefully watching her demeanor. She, she would take her medicine. Mary said her ex-mother-in-law was a wonderful, warm person who didn't have any enemies. Most days, she just watched her TV or read. She was just a whisk. After answering dozens of questions, it became clear to investigators that Mary was not involved in Norma's murder. Her cooperation and her grief were sincere. Please call me. Okay, thank you. I sure will. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Detectives reviewed dozens of statements given by Norma's family, friends, and neighbors. But no one had any useful information. The case quickly threatened to go cold. With no suspects and no solid leads, it looked like Norma Davis's murder 
might never be solved. In Riverside, California, the investigation into the stabbing and strangulation death of 86-year-old Norma Davis, killed in her Canyon Lake home, had ground to a halt. Attention units, we have a possible homicide. As investigators struggled to keep the case alive, another 911 call came in from residents of Canyon Lake. Another elderly woman had been found murdered in her home. There, police discovered 66-year-old June Roberts, dead on her office floor. And for everyone in the room, this crime scene looked disturbingly familiar. Though June Roberts had not been stabbed, she still wore an expensive ring and had a phone cord wrapped around her neck. Credit cards were scattered around her purse but nothing appeared to be missing. For criminalist Alyssa Mayo Thompson, it was obvious that June Roberts and Norma Davis's murders were connected. The type of crimes, both brutal homicides occurring within a few short days of between each other in this area, led us to think that these two crimes may be linked. Investigators scoured the home. A Bible caught detectives' attention. Inside was a handwritten prayer list. Norma Davis's name was on that list. The two victims were friends. But for Detective Greco, how they were connected to the killer was unclear. He could be certain about one thing, however. A serial killer was targeting elderly women in Canyon Lake. This whole case is overwhelming in that it's not something that, that one in law enforcement comes across every day. It's, it's, it's a crime of, a, of serious violence, and, and it wasn't stopping. I mean, it was just the beginning. And so far, this killer had made few mistakes. But a week after June Roberts' death, that all seemed to change. June Roberts' daughter brought police a statement from one of her mother's credit card companies. Someone had gone on a spending spree immediately after June's death, charging jewelry, clothing, and other merchandise. It was the break detectives were waiting for. Now they had a paper trail to follow. They started at a jewelry store, where the first purchase with the murdered victim's card had been made. The clerk vaguely recalled the transaction. She remembered that a blonde woman came into the store and purchased an expensive set of earrings. The woman charged the items and signed her name, June Roberts. The clerk couldn't provide enough detail for a composite sketch but she gave investigators a Xerox copy of an identical pair of earrings. Else? The blonde woman, whoever she was, had been linked to one of the victims. And if you can think of anything. The next purchase on June Roberts' credit card came from a hair salon. A stylist there remembered the woman claiming to be June Roberts. She said the woman was in her mid-thirties with shoulder-length blonde hair, hazel eyes, and a medium build. She added that the woman had a young boy with her. According to her appointment book, his name was Jonathan Weaver. An artist was brought in to translate the stylist's description of the blonde woman into a composite sketch. Gradually, a face took shape. Yes. What would you change about it? But police still didn't know how this woman fit into the murders. And they had no way to put a name to her face. 
Pursuing their only other lead, investigators began searching for the young boy, Jonathan Weaver, who had been at the hair salon with the blonde woman. It's very similar. Yeah. They contacted area public schools and found a child with that name. They went to his address and waited. But when they spotted the boy and his mother arriving home, they realized the mother didn't resemble any of the descriptions. I just wanted to ask a couple of questions. How you doing, Questioning son? confirmed that the boy had never been to that salon. Not at all. And neither recognized the woman in the composite. No, I've never seen her. Despite the setback, investigators refused to give up. The locations of the murders and the credit card purchases were all within a five-mile radius of each other. Investigators knew their killer had to be hiding right under their noses. She made more purchases there. Yeah, she made that. Hoping to generate a lead, they decided to run a check of all violent crimes recently reported within that same area. The tactic turned up a possible clue. An elderly woman who owned an antique shop just blocks away from Canyon Lake had been recently assaulted. And this young woman came in. Dorinda Hawkins, still recovering in the hospital, had barely survived the attack. She told investigators that a blonde woman came into her antique shop to ask about framing. When she led the customer into the back to show her some samples, the woman suddenly attacked her from behind. Dorinda felt a rope tightening around her neck. She told detectives that she then began begging for her life. You know, you can have whatever you want, take whatever you want. I have eight children, let me live. And uh, the suspect told her, uh, I'm not doing this for the money. Dorinda had been left for dead, but she managed to regain consciousness. When she came to, her red coiled key band that held the keys to the cash register was missing from her wrist and the money from the register was also gone. And she just kept choking. No, when this shown the composite, point. she positively identified well, the blonde yes, as her assailant. Yes. It does. It was now apparent to investigators that the suspect was not simply an accessory to the other crimes. She was the serial killer. And the rarest type of all, a woman. Investigators raced to put a name with the face on the composite sketch. Since Mary Pierce had known both of the murder victims, police hoped she might have also crossed paths with the killer. No, 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 this won't take long at all. Let me ask you this. Can you put a name to this face? Does this look familiar? When shown the sketch, Mary said that the face kind of resembled her stepdaughter, Dana Sue Gray. Dana Sue Gray, that's my... As Mary described her stepdaughter, the pieces started to fall into place. The information fit the description of the suspect that I was looking for in that uh, she had a key to the first victim's house. She knew the second victim. Um, she, uh, she had a pass to get into Canyon Lake, and uh, she, was, she was familiar with the area. Mary added that Dana owned a house in Canyon Lake. So you do know those? Two? But Dana had just gone through a vicious divorce battle and was trying to sell the place because of the resulting financial ruin. Her job as a registered nurse was not enough to support the affluent lifestyle she had come to enjoy. The positive identification of the sketch and the information provided by Mary Pierce led detectives to obtain a warrant to search Dana Sue Gray's property. But that would take time. And given the suspect's propensity for violence, they didn't want to give her a chance to kill again. Undercover officers immediately put her under surveillance. Riverside County investigators 
continued looking into Dana Sue Gray's background. They learned that she was currently dating a man who had a young child named Jonathan Weaver, the same name as the child who had been at the hair salon. But this Jonathan Weaver was enrolled in private school. Previously, detectives had only searched public school records. Later that afternoon, one of the officers picked up Dana's trail in nearby Sun City as she entered a bank. She's going to the bank right now. When she left a few minutes later, Dana was seen stuffing a large amount of cash into her purse. Okay, we're gonna go and a few the hours later, Riverside police had obtained their search warrant. Detective Greco briefed the team on the items of evidence they were looking for once they made their way inside the suspect's house. We had receipts from the, the different locations that the purchases were made for these various items, so they knew exactly what they were looking for. Also, I had directed the, uh, the searchers to uh, collect all of the shoes within the residence because of the, obviously, the, the first victim's, uh, the shoe print in the first victim's case. In the early evening hours of March 16, 1994, Riverside County investigators took suspected serial killer Dana Sue Gray into custody. She was taken to the Riverside Police Station for questioning. Inside the residence, investigators uncovered a wealth of evidence. They located a red-coiled key wristband, identical to the one stolen from Dorinda Hawkins at the antique shop. They also found merchandise similar to items purchased with June Roberts' credit cards. Inside Dana's purse, police made an ominous discovery. There was $1,900 in cash and a checkbook in the name of Dora Beebe. The address on the checks was from Sun City. Though Dora Beebe's name meant nothing to investigators, they knew that Dana Sue Gray had been in Sun City earlier that day. The search continued into the bedroom. Okay. What do you got? There, evidence technicians found a pair of Nike sneakers. The evidence was sent to the crime lab. Dana, you understand why you're here, don't you? At the police station, Dana Sue Gray appeared calm and unaffected. She denied killing or assaulting anyone. I think it looks exactly like you. She admitted using credit cards belonging to June and another woman, whose name she couldn't remember, but claimed she had found them lying next to a dumpster. You know what, can I see those earrings? Investigators collected Dana's earrings, which appeared to be the ones purchased on June Roberts' credit card. These look very familiar to me. As the detective left the interview to process the earrings, another investigator was waiting to speak to him outside. There had been another murder. The M.O. was identical to the Norma Davis and June Roberts homicides. The latest victim had been killed earlier that day in her home, which was located in Sun City. Riverside, California police believed that the suspect in the murders of Norma Davis and June Roberts was finally in their custody. As they questioned Dana Sue Gray about the murders, detectives were informed that Dora Beebe, an elderly resident in nearby Sun City, had been found murdered. That crime scene bore the same signature as the other homicides in Canyon Lake. Detectives realized they had found cash and a checkbook in the name of Dora Beebe while searching Dana's house. Dana Sue Gray had killed again, just a short while before the surveillance on her began. And you found June Roberts' credit cards in the dumpster too. Now, 
They needed to be certain that she would never be free to kill again. At the crime lab, examiners analyzed the sneakers recovered from Dana Sue Gray's bedroom. They were size six and a half Nike Air sneakers, the same style and size as the print recovered from the Norma Davis crime scene. Analysis of the characteristics that distinguish one shoe print from another left investigators with little doubt that Dana Sue Gray's shoes had left the print in Norma's condo. Unable to explain away all of the evidence amassed against her, Dana Sue Gray had no choice but to confess to her crimes. Riverside County investigators believe that Dana Sue Gray was driven over the edge by her financial misfortunes that resulted from her divorce. Angry and envious, she chose affluent victims, sometimes strangers, but mostly friends and relatives, as targets for murder. To avoid the death penalty, Dana Sue Gray pled guilty to the multiple murders. She was given two life sentences without the possibility of parole. When I think of Dana Sue Gray, the first thing that comes to mind, for me anyway, is, is evil. It's just evil. There are usually patterns to serial murder, though they're often hard to detect. Only time, patience, and meticulous forensic science can delve into the unknown and finally bring them to light. But ultimately, that's what detectives need to stop the killers who are driven by bloodlust. It's a good, tight little house. Uh, we've never really had any problems. I'm sure you guys enjoy it. A New York home buyer gets more than he bargained for when a house inspection turns up a mummified corpse. For decades, the crime had gone undiscovered, the victim unmissed, and the killer unpunished. Now, investigators face a double mystery, identifying the victim and finding the murderer. In a rural Indiana hospital, a sudden soaring death rate raises critical questions about one of the nurses. It appears a poisoner has joined the staff, but the proof is scant, and building the case will require intensive care. When faith is misplaced, the result can be murder, leading investigators to solve another case of broken trust. episode, some of the names have been changed. Nassau County, New York, on Long Island, is home to almost a million and a half people. It's close enough to enjoy the benefits of New York City while maintaining a quiet, suburban lifestyle. Yeah, you can see yeah. the water damage. In the fall of 1999, a new resident oh, made the final walkthrough of the house he was about to purchase. The solid, old structure had weathered more than 50 New York winters. Within its walls, a half century of history had passed. Some stayed behind. Tucked in the crawl space, a 55-gallon drum sealed tight. According to the seller, it had always been there, too heavy to move. The homeowner assumed it was filled with construction debris. The buyer wanted it gone. Together, they managed to move it to the curb. But the trash collector refused to take it. Its weight exceeded the limit. Hoping to divide the load, the owner attempted to pry off the lid. Rust had made it almost impossible.
Finally, he managed to breach the seal. The stench was staggering and unmistakable. Inside was a withered hand. The owner rushed to call the police. He'd only caught a glimpse, but that was all he needed. Detectives Brian Parpan and Robert Edwards arrived, along with crime techs. The owner described the situation. Detective Parpan took it from there. The first impression was a, a, an, an overwhelming odor when we opened the barrel. Inside the barrel, we could see a hand that certainly appeared to be human. The barrel itself and the information that we had initially at the scene, we thought we were looking at something probably about 18 to 20 years old. Before the barrel was moved, Detective Parpan ordered it thoroughly photographed, inside and out. Ooh, Detective Robert Edwards devised his strategy. We closed the barrel up at that time and decided that we were going to uh, take the whole package to the medical examiner's office where we could do a, a, a very uh, in-depth investigation. You know, this is a little unusual. You come to somebody's house, a new owner is coming in to take over, and he see, looks in a crawl space, and he finds a 55-gallon drum. We eventually find out that there's a body in it. Now we want to make sure there's nothing buried in the area around the house before we give it up. When they could find no evidence of any other bodies around the house, the investigation shifted to the medical examiner's office. We can put the others... Investigators processed the contents of the barrel. Their most puzzling find, handfuls of granules or pellets. The detectives had no clue what they were made of or what they were used for. They tagged some to send to the lab. Next, green liquid. Again, its chemical composition and relevance remained a mystery, at least for now. Further digging put the homicide detectives into more familiar territory. A small purse emerged from the depths, its soaking wet contents practically disintegrating. Still, maybe it held a clue. Can you get at it? Yes. And then, the victim. Mummified in the airless, waterlogged tomb. Hiding a secret for so many years. The body concealed more peculiar objects underneath. The single stem of a plastic flower. I'm not sure what this is. Plastic. A locket with an inscription to Patrice from Uncle Phil, suggesting the victim was female. Some more liquid and some sediment. And among the sediment, two gold rings, one with the initials MHR inscribed inside. For that, the jewelry could certainly be important. We have a name, uh, Patrice. We have a second name, Uncle Phil. So this gives us some background that we can search and try to find out who we're dealing with, who the victim is. But the most obvious clue was perhaps the barrel itself. Right, look at this. There's just some kind of identification on the bottom of it. We didn't see it before because it hasn't been over. Do sure. you want to get a photograph of that? Okay. Upended, it revealed letters stenciled and embossed into it and the fragment of a sticker or logo suggested it once served a more legitimate purpose. The authorities would follow up on it, but first, the victim had to be freed. Removing the remains from the barrel, it was quite laborious. It took quite a long time. Uh, it was done very, very slowly. The material that was in the barrel, eventually we learned, was to weight it down, was removed ladle by ladle. Uh, it was separated. It was put aside for our lab to be tested. 
and then actually removing the body was done very, very carefully so as not to cause any additional damage. The remains were sent to the medical lab. Detective Parpan and his team turned their attention to an address book pulled from the victim's purse. Oh, this is completely saturated. So, can you get a picture of that, please? The liquid had reduced the pages to little more than pulp. Let me flip it for you. As a clue, it, it didn't yep. look promising. Try not to tear it. But oh, a business so card can tucked inside the handbag showed a Doctor's little more potential. It came from a physician in Union City, New Jersey. Boy, that's really Down the hall, the victim herself underwent an examination. Her mummified body was carefully measured even though time had shrunk her remains, her bones revealed her approximate living height, about four foot nine. Her bone structure indicated she was probably in her late 20s and possibly of Hispanic descent. As part of her autopsy, she was x-rayed. The films revealed she suffered a massive head injury. They displayed unusual gold bridge work in her mouth. Nice headshot. And they exposed a great deal more. She was pregnant. Near term pregnancy. Look at that. The cause of death here was somewhat obvious in the, the blunt trauma to the head. The pregnancy, which was a shock to everybody, uh, gave us probably in our own minds an initial motive that we'd be dealing with someone this far along in their pregnancy. Investigators turned their attention to the dental work, which appeared to have been made outside of the United States. The additional things that came out of the autopsy and the forensic odontologist informed us of the, uh, the dentistry, the unusual type of uh, dental activity that was there, so we were dealing with someone from another country. So we were able to pretty much come up with a race, an age, and the fact that this person was uh, uh, obviously a homicide victim, but a pregnant homicide victim. The autopsy told investigators much about the victim, but not the most crucial thing, who she was. After all this time, flesh still remained on her fingers, an outside chance her prints could be raised. According to standard procedure, some fingers were amputated and sent to Detective Charles Costello. Well, I was advised I was going to be getting fingers from the individual in the, in the drum, and I didn't know what to expect as far as condition of the skin, the tissue, the, the body of the tissue of, of the fingers that I would receive. Though still flexible, the shriveled fingers didn't lend themselves to ordinary ink rolling. To eliminate the wrinkles and expose the ridge detail, Costello used a hypodermic to inflate the tips with air. But the skin deflated too quickly. Costello revised his plan. What I did, I took twine and devised a tourniquet, or put a tourniquet around the second digit of the finger. Same way you would stop the blood, I was trying to stop the air from leaking out of the finger. I tied it off as tight as I could. I again, attempted with the uh, hypodermic needle. Was successful in getting it to inflate and stay inflated. He rolled and printed the finger. And after all that, a search of the New York State and FBI fingerprint archives revealed no matches. It's been said that you can tell a person by the company she keeps, and that is what investigators were counting on. The victim's address book, saturated and almost useless, provided the last desperate chance to find her identity. Most pages were stuck together, too fragile to move, too faded to read. Forensic document examiner Joan Fertner began to gently pry the loose pages apart. The process could not be rushed. 
As each page dried, Fertner separated it and returned the address book to the drying chamber. What I had to do was take the evidence and I had to put it into a forensic drying cabinet, which helps to draw out the moisture and that helps the paper fibers in the paper to become stronger so I can manipulate the pages better. Detectives already had one address to follow up from the physician's business card in the victim's purse. You can see. The number had been disconnected. Let's check the book, book on Jersey. Got the Jersey book right here. Must have known we need it right on top. Uh, a New Jersey phone book provided a physician of the same name at a different address. Detectives were dispatched. Uh, yes, we'd like to talk about They this. learned the doctor had long since passed away. His daughter had taken over the practice, but had only kept records for five years. Even if the victim had once been a patient 20 years ago, today it was as if she had never existed. And that meant that someone had gotten away with murder. In New York, detectives Brian Parpan and Robert Edwards chased a phantom. An unnamed pregnant woman killed decades ago by an unknown assailant. They had a locket to Patrice, love, Uncle Phil. We have a doctor's name. And they had her ring with the initials MHR. It was not much help. Everybody's trying to come up with what that Detectives notified the missing person squad, providing only a first name and asking them to go back in their database to 1980. And nothing at that time had been computerized, so we had people come in, begin to search, do a hand search of the records. We're looking at an area of well over five or six million people, and a lot of people go missing in, a, uh, in that period of time. Bobby, there's nothing here. I can't do anything. Another for dead us. end. Not, not doing anything for us. Yeah, you know. In the Nassau County criminalist section, detectives like Charles Conti took a different approach, focusing on the mysterious pellets found in the barrel. We are trying to um, determine a possible origin of the pellets themselves, or in this particular case, um, it might be related to the barrel in which they were found in. The pellets burned, giving off the unmistakable smell of plastic. A chemical analysis determined they were polystyrene, used to manufacture common household objects. If we can trace back an origin, we might be able to link that to a possible suspect who might have been in contact with a deceased. On the theory that the industrial pellets and the industrial barrel were linked, Detective Parpan oh, followed so a lead. Detective Parpan from Nassau County Homicide Squad. He was happy to find out they were still doing business. We were able to contact them. By telling them the stenciling and the numbers that we had on the barrel, they were able to inform us that that particular barrel was manufactured in March of 1963. And that that barrel, because it had a sticker on it, would have been sent to a chemical company. That company closed in 1970, but was acquired by another one. The detectives traced the lead to the new company. The quality assurance manager checked the lot number. What's in these barrels? He determined the barrel carried a green liquid dye that stopped being manufactured in 1970. The same green liquid that immersed the victim. What are we doing, Brian? The investigators felt they were making progress. Just trying to get some information down here, Bobby, so we can try to get a handle on it. They now had a timeline for the murder. Between 1963, when the barrel was manufactured, and 1970, when the dye stopped being made. Present to back. Present to back. But the building permits indicated the crawl space wasn't dug until the 1980s. So the murder had to have occurred after that date. Investigators wanted to talk to the homeowners who built the addition. 
because of where it was found, it's found under a house. So we're looking at something that we feel is a short list of suspects. Um, our initial thoughts was who built this uh, extension. You, you don't expect someone in a house to leave something like this there. You would expect someone who had a chance to be there undetected might put it there. This we knew it was going to present a problem. And these people. Yeah, get you something to drink. According to records from City Hall, the extension was built in 1984, creating the crawl space where the barrel was found. Investigators paid a call on the owners of the house at that time. They'd purchased it in 1971. The extension was already there. It was completed, yeah. But they had surprising news. They informed us that the extension was already there and that it wasn't until they sold the house that a certificate of occupancy uh, was actually signed and filed. The family you purchased it from. The crawl space existed years before there was any official record of it, muddying the trail, but not for long. Flower business, plastic flowers. Plastic flowers? Yeah. They also informed us that the people that they purchased the house from, that he was an owner of a plastic flower company. As the detectives inched closer to the possible identity of the killer, forensic document examiner Joan Furtner shed light on the victim. Some of the pages from the address book had dried enough to read. But after decades bathed in liquid dye and body fluids, most entries were no longer legible. Furtner used an alternate light source to decipher the faded writing. The video spectral comparator is an instrument that's hooked up to a computer monitor. And there are a series of cameras and filters and light sources that allow you to see from the ultraviolet to the infrared range of the spectrum. And it allows you to see outside of the range that the eyes normally can see. Among the first things the apparatus revealed were the name, address, and resident alien number of the book's owner the female victim. I knew we had hit, hit pay dirt and that this was something significant. The investigators knew it too. Parpan and Edwards received the immigration records and a photo of the victim, Angelica Mara Quinn. Born in El Salvador in 1941, immigrated to the US in 1966 and dead before the decade was out. She came to the U.S. to work as a nanny, then began working at a plastic flower company. Based on the work that we did in the city to get information on Melrose Flower, we were able to identify who the owners of Melrose Flower were. The company had two owners. One of them, Howard Elkins, also owned the house at the time the addition and crawl space were constructed. We had spoken with all the other owners in the house. Uh, Mr. Elkins was the only one who was out of state. Howard Elkins, the homeowner when the crawl space was dug, had become the prime suspect in the murder of Angelica Morrow Quinn. But the gap between suspicion and final justice can loom large. And investigators still had miles to go. Investigators had given a name and a face to an anonymous murder victim. Now they followed the trail of her killer. Before confronting their prime suspect, Howard Elkins, New York detectives Brian Parpan and Robert Edwards traveled to Florida to speak with his former business partner. He recognized photos of the barrel and said the company used to receive dye in them. Matter of fact, and it, it contains Then, dye. Detective yeah, Parpan asked girl, him about Howard well, Elkins. Now, that in was not he was aware that uh, Mr. Elkins had had an affair while he was working at Melrose uh, Plastic and Flower Company. He had no information on it, but he knew that he had an affair, and he also knew that Mr. Elkins' wife and uh, father-in-law had found out about it. The affair was with one of the employees, 
a petite Hispanic woman with long, dark hair and gold bridge work. He didn't know much about her. One day, she stopped coming to work. He recalled that a short time after the woman stopped coming to work, he took a phone message for Howard Elkins. It was a landlord in Hoboken, New Jersey. He wanted to know if Mr. Elkins wanted to keep the apartment. The woman no longer lived there. The partner gave the message to Elkins, and the next day saw him come to work with his car filled with boxes and a television set. The detectives were now absolutely convinced Elkins was their man. The description that the business partner gives of this particular person, uh, even though we're dealing with a mummified body, is exactly what we're looking at um, when we remove uh, the body from the barrel. Have a seat. Armed with the information, but revealing none of it, the investigator spoke with Howard Elkins himself. Did you ever have an affair with you? He invited us in, and it was almost like a game. He knew we knew, we knew he knew, we knew. He was trying to find out information from us, and we were trying to find out information from him. But he gave up nothing. Elkins denied he'd ever seen that type of barrel. I'm sorry, I know nothing about those. Mr. Elkins, you're going to tell us you've never seen a barrel like that before. He remained poised and indifferent. Can we believe you're involved? The investigators wouldn't I'm relent. Saying, well, I know where that barrel came. I know where it's manufactured. We, we didn't push your foot with him at all. I mean, we told him that, as far as we're concerned, you, you killed this girl. I can't be Excuse me, John, I have a call. Hello? His wife phoned. Elkin spoke with her for a few moments, then asked the detectives to leave. General, I'm sorry. I really have nothing else to say. I can't talk anymore. I'd appreciate it if you'd leave right now. They asked him to provide a DNA sample, but he declined. I'll tell you what. We're going to leave. We're going to leave because you asked us to. But we're coming back. I stood uh, right in front of him, and I said, Mr. Elkins, we, we're leaving. I want you to know something. We're going to get a court order. I'm going to get a court order for your blood. I'm going to match your blood up to the dead baby and that dead woman. And we're going to come back. We're going to put you in jail for the rest of your life. You understand that, Mr. Elkin? You have a good day now, and we'll be back. But that was the last time Detective Parpan saw Howard Elkins. The next day, uh, we attempted to get the warrants, and they were slow coming. Uh, that evening, we were notified, we were called to see if we had him in our custody. Apparently, his wife was looking for him. He turned up the next day. His dark secret, kept hidden for 30 years, had finally destroyed him. The investigation continued. The medical examiner extracted a blood sample. The DNA was compared to the unborn child Angelica Maroquin carried. The baby was his. Work on the address book continued. Names and phone numbers were revealed. After 30 years, None worked, except one. Yes, hi, this is Joni. What we're doing is, uh, we're conducting... Angelica's friend had wondered about her all this time. An incident that happened on Long Island. When, is, when was this? Well, it's what, just how, recent. She told investigators she thought the young woman had returned to her family and was shocked to learn how her story had ended. In a phone book that we were interested in. She provided the detectives with the missing chapters. How it appeared there and, and what you may know. After losing touch with Angelica some years ago, the woman received a call from her. She said she was having an affair with her boss, but it was going well. He rented an apartment for her and was going to leave his wife. But a few months later, it began to sour. Angelica told her friend she was pregnant and her boss refused to leave his wife. What 
Angelica had told his wife about the affair, and her boss threatened her life. Her friend said Angelica sounded panicked when she called. She asked her friend to come over. Angelica! And when she arrived at the apartment, Angelica! there was nobody there. The door was open. Angelica! The table was set for lunch. There were no signs of a struggle, no signs of a fight. But uh, Angel was not there. She waited for a period of time, and then she went to the local police. It was too soon to file a missing persons report. That was the last anyone had seen of Angelica Maroquin. But you know, she said he treated her so well. Investigators surmised between the time the friend spoke to Angelica on the phone and the time she arrived at the apartment, Elkins had shown up and ended her life. Killers often turn against those they love, leaving behind traces of their callous ways. Others prey upon those who empower them with blind trust. Clinton, Indiana, a small town of 5,000 people. But in 1995, that number started declining, suspiciously. The local hospital served the health needs of the residents of Clinton. The sick came here expecting to get better, and most of them did. In 1994, after a sudden stomach ailment, Ethel Roja was recovering beautifully. I'm doing very well. Her husband, John, could finally relax. Ethel would be coming home soon. Things were going real good in intensive care. Doctor's report was good. Then. I went to the cafeteria to get a bite to eat and a cup of coffee. I would say that about 15 or 20 minutes later, I came back and the uh, picture there was totally opposite the way I left her. When Roja returned, his wife was in cardiac arrest. No one could explain why this woman on the verge of recovery would suddenly suffer heart failure. To doctors, it was a mystery. My wife never was treated for heart disease. Never. She had no medical record of anything along the heart disease line. Never took any kind of medication or nothing. Well, three, three cc's of epi. All right, flat line still, doctor. How okay. We have the floor. Ethel Roja was dead. The official cause of death was acute heart failure. She's going to have to call it. Ethel Roja wasn't the only one. Over the next year, the number of deaths at the county hospital's ICU continued to rise dramatically. Something about these sudden and mysterious deaths didn't seem right. The nursing staff grew suspicious. Let's call it 137. Hoping to find some explanation for the sudden rise in deaths, the supervising nurse reviewed her staff logbooks over the course of the previous years. some disturbing patterns emerged. Between 1993 and 1994, the death rate more than tripled from the previous years. In those two years, they recorded 102 deaths. Many were elderly, but a troubling fact emerged. Nearly all were improving before their sudden demise. After reviewing all the charts, the nurse could find only one similarity. In a large percentage of the deaths, one particular nurse was on duty. The data suggested a chilling scenario. She took the information to the hospital administrator, hoping she'd overlooked something that could explain away her suspicions. But the numbers didn't lie. They had to face the possibility that a member of the hospital staff might be a killer. Patients at a small Indiana hospital were dying at an alarming rate. And in 
and it looked like their deaths were no accident. Just check the heart one more time. The awful realization climbed up the chain of command at the county hospital. They called Indiana State Police investigator Frank Turchi. Detective Turchi, in uh, March of 1995, I was contacted by okay. the chief of police in Clinton, who had been contacted by the uh, hospital attorney. Before we had our first meeting, we had talked to each other about uh, what it could possibly be. And obviously, your first thought is uh, theft of drugs, something like that. You don't think of uh, a murder investigation. That was probably the last thing on our mind. Investigators met with the hospital administrators. They told him the accusation centered on one nurse named Orville Lynn Majors. All indications are at the time, all the hospital staff had to go on were their suspicions. I'm not sure what it means exactly. Since they had no proof of murder, they couldn't even give Turchi the name of a single victim. In a normal investigation, you want to try to find out who did it, like it's a who done it type thing. But in this case, it was in, totally in reverse. I felt like we had a very good suspect, but we had to figure out who he killed and how he killed them. Turchi requested a meeting with the nurse, Orville Lynn Majors. He wanted to talk with him before the hospital tipped him off. He was under investigation. Turchi was too late. They had suspended him and uh, that he had already had a lawyer contact them. So we knew that uh, it was going to be very difficult. That was um, probably the first stumbling point in the investigation. The next stumbling point was the mountains of technical data Turchi and his colleagues had to collate. If hospital patients were being murdered, then the proof was buried somewhere in this mountain of records. There were shorthand type uh, nurses notes that meant something to them, to us it meant absolutely nothing. So we had to be totally educated on medical terminology and, and deciphering medical records. At this crucial preliminary phase of the investigation, Every detail mattered, whether it pertained to Orville Lynn Majors or not. He was either going to be a suspect or he wasn't. But at the beginning, he looked like a pretty good suspect. But we wanted to be very open-minded with that. And, and I wanted to, I was, I was, it was very important to me that we eliminate any possibility other than him. Word of the investigation leaked to the media. Turchi feared the publicity would hurt the investigation. But the angel of death stories offered a mixed blessing. It uh, made people aware that something had happened, possibly. And uh, these people began contacting all their local law enforcement agencies, saying, you know, when my wife or mother or husband, uh, grandmother, whoever it was, died in that intensive care unit, we saw something that at the time we thought looked odd, maybe suspicious, but uh, the last thing you think of is that nurse caring for your family member uh, is killing them. Okay, so we talked a little bit on the phone. Turchi followed up on the messages he received from people who had lost loved ones at the hospital. A woman recalled Nurse Orville Majors injecting something into her mother's IV immediately before she died. Before it was her medication. The woman's death fit the pattern. The patient's health was improving up until the point she suffered cardiac arrest. He started to leave the room. Over and over again, investigators kept hearing similar stories of mysterious injections with fatal results. That's what got the case off and running full speed. And at that point in time, we knew as investigators we had a real real serious problem going on and, and most likely a, a homicide investigation. The case seemed to be growing larger each day. Turchi developed a database to organize the massive amount of information he collected. To prove Orville Majors was killing people, he first had to prove the alleged victims had died unnatural deaths. For the investigation to succeed, he had to determine the most likely victims of foul play. To help decipher the medical records,
Turchi assembled a team of specialists, including Dr. Michael Olinger, an expert in emergency medical care. He compared the suspicious deaths against the records of patients who died under less questionable circumstances. The suspicious deaths stood out. In each case, death suddenly struck a recovering patient. We were, in fact, becoming medical detectives. We were looking at these cases, trying to determine, was this a unnatural or unexpected type of an event? Investigators continued their fact-finding. They sought to gather all they could about Orville Majors and any other potential suspects. So we interviewed uh, nurses, doctors, healthcare people from every facet of, of the hospital, uh, nutritionists, uh, janitorial people, anyone that could have gotten in that intensive care unit and uh, either, either uh, look at them as possible suspects or totally eliminate them. But it always came back to majors. One nurse reported seeing him inject a patient who died almost instantly. Dr. Olinger instructed the investigators to chart the deaths based on their level of suspicion. They needed to link majors to each death. Turchi took the most suspicious cases to special deputy prosecutor Greg Carter. Carter remained unconvinced. I know there are a lot of variables at work there and that in order to charge and convict someone of a criminal act, you have to prove them guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. So the associations or patterns in and of themselves didn't really cause me to leap to any conclusions. That's a real problem. I mean, this hospital had virtually no record keeping. In records. order to bring criminal charges against Orville Lynn Majors, the prosecutor required some forensic proof of poisoning. We knew that if we could find a toxin in the autopsy, that that would be a very huge step in coming up with a smoking gun. But that in itself wouldn't necessarily be the smoking gun. We knew that we had to somehow link that toxin to our suspect. What do you know? Do you know anything else? Do you know anything First else? things first. Turchi had to find the toxin, and that meant exhumation. Turchi began the delicate job of asking survivors for permission to dig up their loved ones for autopsy. We should say that we're going to have to exhume her body and do an autopsy. If the evidence existed, it was buried with the victims. And we will stay in contact. It was a very difficult time for them, obviously, and, and for us also. I think that the families that uh, the investigators dealt with uh, knew that they were doing the very best they could to try to solve this case and, and find out why their family member died. Finally, the autopsies commenced. The medical examiner looked for a variety of toxins and found absolutely nothing. When they did the first two or three autopsies and they never came up with uh, an obvious cause of death or a toxin, we were disappointed. Then it became apparent to us that it was unusual in the fact that they were finding no obvious cause of death. It was a new way to think about the case. The fact that nothing suspicious was found provided grounds for suspicion. In fact, it could be their biggest clue so far. Dr. Olinger examined the EKG readings from the deceased patients to find a common pattern pattern that we recognized was many of these patients that died, they would die from a sudden loss of heart activity. Uh, their heart would be beating fine, and all of a sudden, over a matter of less than a minute, uh, they would get a, a widening of their heart rhythm and then just flatline. Dr. Olinger reasoned whatever substance caused patients to die like that must also occur naturally in the body. That is why it wouldn't stand out in the autopsy. It would let the killer pass unnoticed. It would be the perfect poison. In Indiana, hospital patients were dying mysteriously. Investigators suspected poison. 
the medical investigators researched toxins that would kill quickly and leave no trace. Dr. Michael Olinger knew of a compound that would work like that, potassium chloride. Potassium chloride could kill a, a healthy person. Uh, and so it wasn't unexpected that if potassium chloride was given to these patients, it would have resulted in the types of deaths that we were seeing, which was a sudden loss of electrical activity of the heart. Really to test to his theory this, and build the case, Olinger suggested investigator Turchi bring a toxicologist and a heart specialist aboard. He brought in medical toxicologist Dr. Brent Furby to lend his expertise. Because potassium is present in healthy bodies, if it's used as a poison, it would be difficult to prove. When people die, within a few hours, usually their potassium goes up considerably, it may, it may even triple. So determining that someone has been injected with potassium in a, a patient post-mortem, particularly if they've been exhumed, is, is really, really tough. In fact, I think it's virtually impossible. The healthy heart uses potassium to control its rhythm. Too much potassium overwhelms the organ, causing it simply to stop. And though the presence of post-mortem potassium would prove nothing, a victim of potassium poisoning would show telltale signs of the toxin. Cardiologist Eric Pristowski was brought in to look for them. Potassium is sort of the kingpin of the cell membrane. Potassium in the right concentration allows normal flow of electricity in a cell. If you suddenly give a very large amount of potassium that gets to the heart very quickly, what you do is you affect the heart's membrane so they cannot have electricity flow. And when that happens, the heart stops. Do you carry this drug? Not only is potassium stealthy, yes. it was also it. easy to obtain. Sure it. Yes, we keep Detectives it found that a nurse could take a vial of potassium chloride from the hospital supply without anyone noticing it missing. This is where you keep the drug. A vial of potassium chloride would provide the smoking gun investigator Frank Turchi desperately needed. I obviously wanted a search warrant early for Lynn Major's property. And uh, we just couldn't put it all together. The, the information we had received that would uh, give us suspicion uh, as to what he was doing uh, was, was events that had happened two years prior to uh, our investigation, so obviously uh, didn't, it didn't allow us the time frame uh, in order to get a uh, search warrant. Turchi tried to I, uh, question Majors, I'm not but his sorry. lawyer would not allow We're his client here. to provide specific Thank answers. Thank you. The case was in danger of stalling. These Greg Carter and Frank Turchi needed stronger evidence to get search warrants for Major's home. I understand that you and Lynn are roommates, is that correct? They contacted Major's housemate. He moved into my house and... At first, he was suspicious and reluctant to talk with authorities. As to But eventually, they won his trust. He owned the house that he and Majors lived in. He told investigators that one day, as he was straightening up the garage, he came across some vials of potassium chloride. Here, at last, was the elusive smoking gun. The housemate gave police permission to search his home. This is one that we've prepared. More vials were found on the premises. One thing led to another, and the discovery enabled investigators to get a warrant to search Major's van. More vials turned up. They were processed as evidence. Now that they had linked Major's to potassium chloride, they had to rule out any other possible causes of death. Many of the patients died of heart disease. But now that poisoning was suspected, cardiologist Bruce Waller was called in to autopsy the hearts to find evidence of that disease. 
I would look for blockages in the arteries, look to see if there's been heart attack, and examine the remaining valves and other aspects of the heart. If the heart were completely normal, then we would be suspicious of some other toxin as the cause of death. The hearts were healthy. The suspicions were confirmed. Investigators had gathered enough evidence to arrest Orville Lynn Majors on suspicion of murder. The evidence concluded that uh, Lynn Majors was uh, taking a patient in the intensive care unit, developing the opportunity for him to be alone with that patient, injecting the potassium chloride into the patient, causing their death, and uh, doing it to make it look medically like this person took a turn for the worse and died. The investigation took nearly four years, but in the end, it paid off. Orville Lynn Majors was convicted and sentenced to 360 years in prison. There is no deceit colder than a trust that is betrayed. When that betrayal turns deadly, police turn to forensic science to avenge the victims of broken trust.